Good morning. It's sure good to be with you this morning. Uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that your spirit would pour down on us this morning, that you would give us new wisdom from your word, that, Lord, you would open it to us and give us better understanding. And, Lord, as we hear it, may we walk in newness of life and in strength, uh, living in pure freedom that only you can bring. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you, this message finds you well and healthy. Uh, I hope it finds you walking closer to the Lord this week than you did last. Uh, we've been in a mini-series of sermons, um, and the title of this one is Lock the Door. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 12, and yes, we're only going to go through 43 through 45. I know it's out of the ordinary for me, but don't worry, I pull several other passages in with it. The, the series title that we've had is, How Do We Go and Sin No More? And we take this from the passage we talked about last week. Uh, the woman caught in adultery. Jesus' comment to her was, uh, who condemns you? She says, there's no one around. And he says, I don't condemn you either, but I want you to go home and stop sinning. Stop the sinning business. So how do we go about that? The questions we're trying to answer in this series is, how do we keep a clean heart? How do we deal with the setbacks in our life? Or maybe, how do we deal with the addictions that plague us? How do we get over our bad habits or the hang-ups that just keep showing up? So our first sermon, we talked about Paul and Silas and, and the woman that... Um, the slave woman that had the, the demon that controlled her life. And we talked about the chains that hold us down, the addictions that we have, the sin that's in our lives. They trap us, and as hard as we fight and as much as we struggle, we can't be free of them. We can only go as far as those chains will let us. And what we really need is for those chains to be broken. And the only one that can give us real freedom, freedom indeed, is Jesus himself. And like we talked about in that first sermon, we need an earthquake to shatter the chains that bind us, to tear down the walls of our prison from its very foundations. And only God can really do that. Our second sermon, we talked about how do we get those chains broken. Um... And now that we have them broken, what do we do? Well, to have those chains broken, we first have to admit that we have sinned. We ask God to forgive us and show mercy on us. And then, once he has done that, the chains are broken, the slavery is now gone, and we are free people, what do we do with that? Well, we do what Jesus told the woman. We go home to our own home, we get away from the sin, we turn from our sin. It's called repentance. We go not to say, oh, I'm sorry, and then to venture back into it, but we go home, away from where we were, out of the sin that we were in, and be free from it. Um, so this morning's sermon, what we're going to be talking about is, what do we do now? We have had the chains broken, We've left the sin, we've walked away from it, we've gone home, we're, we're, we, are, we have repented, we've turned from it, so how do we keep going? What do we do now? Um, and some of the questions we're going to be answering is, is it possible to be free? Now I know both of the last sermons have answered this question, but one more can't hurt, right? The answer we'd better be coming up with is absolutely we can be free. Freedom is nothing for God. What's impossible with us, yes, what we can't do, the, the addictions that hold us that we can't break from, yes, we can't do it. But with God, all things are possible, right? Um, so then the next question we have is, how do we keep from sinning anymore? What barriers do we have to put up? And how do we keep the problem from coming back? So, before we get into this, here's a big question. Is there demon possession? Is it real? Now, obviously, I'm going to say yep to that answer. 
Um, but there's usually, when you start talking about demon possession, uh, there's about three responses that people give. Um, the first one is, they just think you're crazy. And they say, in this time of not believing in the miraculous, that mental illness, it's just, or demon possession, what we would call it, or what they called it back then, was really, now we know it's just mental illness in our modern world and science, and there's not really any possession that takes place on the inside. Uh, another response is, maybe there is, but mostly it's just made up. It's it's made for the movies. It's It's sensationalized to scare you. And then there's a third camp that's, has real fear of the unseen uh, a realistic being scared of what we can't see beyond our uh, senses and our realms well to answer the question is there demon possession I have three responses as well and the first one is the Bible says that there is demon possession as a pastor and as a Christian so I'd better say that there is too uh, further than that, Jesus said that there was demon possession. So if he says it, well, I'd better say it too. And further yet, <laughs> Jesus didn't say there was demon possession. He cast out the demons that were possessing. Uh, so is there demon possession? Yes, there is demon possession in the world. Do oftentimes it gets dismissed? Yes. Does oftentimes it gets over, uh, over sensationalized? Yes. But is there something to be really scared of? Yes, there is. We need to fear demon possession. Um, so how many times did Jesus cast out demons? Well, to be honest, I really don't know, and nobody really does. Um, because the scriptures don't give us that information. Uh, there are passages where he just says the people came that were sick and demon-possessed, and he healed them all. Now, there are seven times, I mean, if you ask numbers in, in the Bible, right, you often come up with a number seven. There are seven times that are recorded specifically in the scriptures where Jesus cast out demons. And we're going to deal with the seventh one. I have all of these listed, but they're not in order, and we're not going to go through them. But the seventh one, the last one there, we are going to deal with in our passage today. So, as I'm going through this, am I saying that if, uh, that your demon possession, if, possessed if you have a addiction or a habit or hang up absolutely not don't take me out of context but i want to show you the correlation because jesus makes some of those correlations um and we want to deal with those um not always are people possessed uh but sometimes they are afflicted by satan job in chapter one and chapter two the whole book of job is about how satan afflicted job and uh the one passage says Satan afflicted him with boils from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. Must have been awful. You can also think of the Apostle Paul, right? He said that the thorn in his side was a messenger from Satan to keep on tormenting him. And then another one, Jesus healed the crippled woman. Remember on the Sabbath, she'd been bent over for 18 years. Jesus said himself, this person whom Satan has bound, and he released her, um, and he said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. That same idea of freedom um, uh, of the captives and uh, prisoners being let loose. And so sometimes it's not just oppression, but it's being afflicted. And we can definitely be afflicted physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And that's what addictions are, right? That's what habits can be. That's what our hang-ups, the things that we keep falling over and over again that's what they can be so, um what i'm actually saying i'm not saying that if you have habits and action uh habits and hang-ups and addictions that you're demon possessed but what i am saying is if god can heal you of a demon and it's nothing for him then him taking care of your habits your addictions your hang-ups it's nothing. If God can take the worst of situations, uh, an absolute oppression, an absolute control by a demon, more than, it's nothing for him to take care of your addictions. The primary problem is not getting rid of the demon itself. We would think that that control, because we can't do it. We can't 
break ourselves of these chains. We would think that the problem is actually being possessed and getting rid of that. That's the hard part, but really it's not. Um, Matthew chapter 12 is kind of filled with these stories. Matthew 12, 9 through 14, um, Jesus heals a man of leprosy. And their idea of leprosy was the punishment for sin. It was the uncurable thing. It was a miracle if it happened. But it was nothing for Jesus. And you go down further to verse 22. Um, there was a man that was brought to him that was demon-possessed. He was blind and mute. And he healed him so that the blind and the mute both spoke and saw. Now, this problem here of being blind and mute was, it was over the top. Uh, back then, they had the idea that a mute, one that could not speak because of the demon possession, was the hardest to cast out. And the reason it was was because you had to be able to get the demon to say its name. You remember the one time Jesus said, what is your name? And the, and the demon said, legion, because there were many in us, many of us. The idea was it showed control. Because if you got to where you could call it by name, you had control over it now. Like Adam having control over the animals of the earth, God gave Adam the right and the ability to name the animals. Um, so if it was mute, it would obviously be very difficult because the person could never say the name of the demon that was holding it because it was mute. Jesus takes this guy, the hardest of all the demon possessed, and casts him out like nothing. The idea here is, if God can heal you, if God can release you from that oppression, there's nothing he can't release you from. The problem isn't the initial control. It's not being free of the demon that's the problem. Jesus has that power. Our bigger problem is not getting free. So let's go to our passage. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. Um, when an unclean spirit, Jesus says, goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, the unclean spirit says, I will return to my house which I have, from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and he takes with with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. What Jesus in this obscure, this really odd passage, it's just, it sticks out. What he says is, your biggest problem isn't being released from it. The biggest problem is being free of the unclean spirit, being free of the addiction. And we know that to be true, right? You can stop smoking for a long time and then something triggers it and you pick it right back up, right? Same thing with any addiction. Um, overeating or you know, not taking a bath, right? <laughs> All kinds of things. The idea is the problem isn't getting rid of it. The problem is making sure we stay rid of it. But the biggest, oh, I'm sorry, the bigger problem is that they come back. How do we keep the problem from coming back? In this passage, Jesus said, you know, you get rid of him, and then the thing wanders around for a while, and then it decides it wants to come back. Well, it sees everything's clean and open. Well, how do you keep the stupid thing from coming back? The problem is, well, we can't. This passage shows us that we can't stop the problem. We can't stop the addiction. We can't stop even the demon from coming back. But that doesn't mean when he comes back, we have to open the door. When I was younger, I sold Kirby vacuum cleaners door to door. My goal was to get my foot in the door. If I got my foot in the door... People would let me come in and I'd do my spiel and they were kind of stuck there. They wouldn't throw me out just because they were nice people. But I had to get my foot in the door. Well, if people didn't want the Kirby vacuum salesman there, they kept their door lock. I don't know how many people I saw peeking through the curtains of their windows to get rid of me. Same thing here. 
The problem is they come back. So how do we deal with them coming back? We keep the door locked. We don't have to open it back up to them. Our biggest problem, that's a bigger problem. Our biggest problem is staying free of the problems. I will return to the house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and he takes with him seven other spirits, more than himself. And they entered and dwelled there, dwelt there. And the last state of the man was worse than the first. And so it shall be also with this wicked generation. It reminds you of that other demon, the demon um, from the Gadarenes, right? Right? He said, there's a legion, there's 600 of us. How many times did that poor man be free of the demon? And then the demon come back with more and more and more. Oh, that must have been an awful life. That must have been a terrible life. First and foremost, to be free of the demon. You don't open it back up. You don't just leave the place open. You have to want this demon. You have to want this addiction. You have to want this control over your life. You will have to want these chains to be gone for good. I have always seen this passage, verse 46. It's the very next verse after what Jesus said. The very next verse, verse 46, he says, While he was still talking to the multitudes, same time, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. And then somebody said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are still standing out here seeking to speak with you. But Jesus answered and said to him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? He stretched out his hand towards his disciples and he says, Here are my mother, mother, and here are my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I always thought that this was just a really harsh passage. Why would you say that about your family? But the point he was trying to make here that I've always taken out of context is if you, if once, you, once I got it in the light of this passage, if you want to be free, you got to want to be free more than anything else. If you want freedom, your number one focus is doing the right thing. You got to be able to give up the most the things that are most valuable to you to be free. That sounds harsh. That sounds awful. But if you have to get rid of some family so that you get freedom, from these chains, you better do it. I know that sounds harsh. And in Jesus' response here, it gives the idea that he's just dismissing them. He's really not. But he's making the point that if you want real freedom, it takes some sacrifice. It takes doing the right thing. Being willing to do what it takes to be free. So what does it take to be free? You have to want this demon gone for good. You can't do it willy-nilly. You can't do it half-hearted. You've got to go all out. If you don't go all out, you're going to fall right back into the same trap. You're going to be trapped by the same chains. And the second time's going to be worse than the first. Just like Jesus said, you know, if you, if I mentioned it last week in, uh, in, the, other ser in the second sermon, if you break free, if you get out of jail, maybe somehow you got locked up and you get locked in jail and you somehow find a way to break free. If they catch you and they send you back to jail, do you think they're going to treat you the same way? Uh -uh. No, this time they're going to lock your hands. They're going to lock your feet. They may even chain you to the wall. They're going to do whatever it takes to be able to keep you there trapped. Same thing happens in our spiritual life. If we break free and then allow the chains to be back on us, they're going to be worse than the first time because Satan doesn't want to let you go. So you have to want it more than anything. You have to be willing to do what it takes to be free. What else do you have to do? First of all, as Jesus mentioned here, you got to clean the room. You kick him out. He's the only one that can do that. You kick him out. You kick the addiction out, and then you clean the room. You get rid of all of the junk that helps your addictions. 
<laughs> you get rid of all of the needles. You get rid of um, all those other things that shouldn't be there that only assist in your addictions. I saw a wonderful, beautiful girl. She was so sweet in the store today. I was getting stuff for the Mother's Day gifts for church. And she was so kind and friendly. And she was. She was really pretty. And I looked down at her arms and it broke my heart. Because she had marks all over her, her arm. Hundreds of them. Where she'd been cutting herself. Because she didn't see herself. She felt, she felt like she needed punishment. You know what? If it takes getting rid of some knives, get rid of the knives. Get rid of the lies in your mind that help that addiction. Also, you need to remove the junk that brings the temptation. If you're an alcoholic, you don't have the beer bottle sitting there on the counter. If you're a gossiper, you don't keep the horoscope news whatever sitting on the table if you're an overeater or you've got a diabetic problem you don't go and buy the sweets and leave it in the refrigerator or in the cupboard you get rid of the stuff that brings the temptation if you don't have the sweets around you don't get them if you run out of the coffee if you don't have the coffee beans to make the coffee, you don't get to drink any. Remove the junk that brings the temptation. Redecorate. Literally, redecorate. Change the pictures on the wall. Change the shrines that you see every single day. Rearrange its accessibility. You know, when you go into the store, where they got all the candy? They don't have it way up high so the kids can't reach it. No, it's right there next to them. In fact, it lines the aisles while, while you're checking out. Where you're going to stand in place most of the time, that's where they have all the candy. Just in right reach for the kids. Why? Because they know if the kids can reach it, they're going to want it. Same thing in your spiritual life. If you have an addiction, it's time to redecorate. If you have to have the sweets in the house, put them in a place where you're not going to want to reach for them. Where it's going to be too much effort to go get them. I, I like candy and I leave it around the house. So I put my candy in places where it's not easy for my children to go get it. They still do. <laughs> but I try to make it more difficult for them at least. <laughs> Redecorate. You know, if you've got pictures on the wall and you're trying to clean your mind... Remove the pictures so that you don't see them anymore. Change the people, places, and things that need to be cleaned out. If there's people in your life that are holding you back from the freedom of your addiction, get rid of them. If there are places that you would normally go in your addiction, don't go there anymore. If there are things that you have, things that you do, that hold you to that, it's time to clean them out. Also, lock the door and put the guards there. <laughs> if you don't want squatters, lock the door of your mind. My idea here is, when temptations come, when thoughts come, when ideas come in and they knock on the door of your mind... You kick them off the front porch. You don't say, oh, really, I'd like to hear your idea. I don't know how many times I heard people, when I was trying to sell Kirby vacuum cleaners, say, we don't want any, go away. Oh, don't you see the sign that says no solicitation? <laughs> no solicitors. We don't want your business. Don't come on my front door. You do the same thing in your mind. You trap those thoughts, those ideas, those temptations, and you remove them. You kick them out. You resist the devil, and he flees. The Bible says. Also, you need to put loyal guards at the door. You know, you go to an embassy. They've got walls all the way around the embassy. They've got gates where they let people in and out, but most of the time it's closed, right? And they also have guards. And the guards are standing there well armed to prevent anybody coming in that they don't want there. You can't do this alone. You need loyal people in your life that are willing to help the door stay closed. 
You need to have people that you can talk honestly with. Tell them the truth. You, you can let them ask you the hard questions. You can give them permission to keep you accountable without loyal guards. It's real possible the addiction will break back in. How many people have we seen that have tried to break addiction and fall to it over and over and over again? But most of all, the point that Jesus brings out here is you don't leave the room empty. You have to fill it with new tenants. You know, the devil can't, the addictions can't, the habits can't come in if it's filled with something else. What does it say? Uh, idle hands is the devil's workshop, right? Isn't that the phrase? Well, if you're so busy that you don't have time to do the sin, you won't do the sin. You may have the temptation to do it, but you can kick them out when they come knocking on the door. You fill the room. You first clean it, then you lock the door, you put guards up, and then you put in new tenants. Change your habits. Change the places that you go. Change the things that you think about. Change the things that you watch. Change the things that you eat. Little by little, step by step, change the habits that you have. If you don't ever make steps towards being free, you never will be. So change the habits that you have. Put new things in your life, in that room, in your heart, in your mind, that will prevent the enemy from breaking in. Fill your time with important things. Don't fill it with just watching TV. Don't fill it with, with wasteful things. Fill it with useful things, beneficial things. Use it for study and learning. Use it to strengthen you. Going to the gym is a great place to go. Going to the Word is a great place to go. Going to church is a great place to go. You fill the emptiness with important things that are good. Fill the room with good influences. Good peer pressure. You've had bad peer pressure for a long time. It's easy to find bad peer pressure. Change the friends that you have. Oh, you don't want to change my friends. They've been with me through the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. They've been with you through the whole ordeal and they haven't changed you any. Put good peer pressure, good influences on you. People that will steer you the right way, that will encourage you and draw you. Fill the room with prayer. You know what? When Jesus' name is plastered all over the walls and on the ceiling and on the floor, Satan can't come in. If you resist Satan in the name of Jesus, he's got to flee. So plaster Jesus' name all over the walls of your heart. Plaster him all over the ceiling. Plaster him all over the floor. It, the scripture says, pray always without ceasing. Don't stop. Keep filling it. The temptation comes in. The devil comes knocking on the door. Start praying. Throw him off the porch. Fill the room with prayer. Then fill the room with scripture. Fill the room with God's promises. Put it literally on the doorposts of your heart. There's passages that I take and I put... I print them out. I put tape on them and I stick them on my Suburban. So every time I go to change the radio or turn it up, I see those verses. Change. Fill the room with scriptures. Remind yourself, if you have the promises of God, the lies that the, enemies are, that the enemy is going to tell you, you won't believe. Fill the room with good influences. Good peer pressure. Friends that are loyal to you, that will help you, really. Fill it with prayer. Your power is in prayer. Fill it with scripture. So scripture is the only offensive weapon that we are given. Fill the room with the weapons of our warfare. So finally, literally finally, aren't you excited? Woohoo! 
Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, he even says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate, think on, deliberate in your mind on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And look at his conclusion. And the God of peace will be with you. You know, if God's in the room, Satan's not barging in. Satan can't get past that wall. Change your thought patterns. Clean up the room. Get the old addictions out. Lock the door. Put people around you that will make sure that door doesn't get broken into. Fill the room with new tenants, new habits, new ideas. You've re-wallpapered. You've changed the looks on the inside. You've filled the place with prayer. You've filled the place with God's word, the scriptures and promises. And you've changed your thought pattern, thinking on the true, the noble, the just, the pure, the lovely, the good reports, the virtuous, the praiseworthy. You've filled this room with these things. The addictions aren't coming back. Live out. I, I remember I, back years ago, I was in a company, and one of the things they always said was, if you see somebody that you want what they have, you have to ask them about it. Don't ask somebody that doesn't have it. Ask the person that has the fruit in the tree. So if you've got an addiction, a habit, a hang-up, if you've got the devil controlling your life, search out people that have had victory over it. Just like the church at Philippi was looking to Paul. The things that you've learned, the things that you receive from them, do them. And the God of peace will live in that room. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know this is a practical sermon, rather straightforward. Sometimes it's often a little too straightforward. But Lord, we know the truth of your word. It reigns on this world. Satan would love to say that he controls this world, but he doesn't because you're in control. You're not only in control of the world, you're in control of our hearts. And Lord, we ask if there's anything in us that is a habit, a hang-up, an addiction, a sin that we can't get past, we ask that you'd remove it from us, that you'd clean the room for us, that you'd help us to be in repentance, turning away from our sin, and then filling our lives with things that will prevent those addictions and hang-ups and sins from coming back. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. I hope this has been beneficial. I hope it's been encouraging. And I hope and pray that God releases you and keeps you from the bonds that Satan has so held you from. God bless.